in Acts chapter 13, verses 38 and 39. If man teaches another doctrine, imposing upon other men a confession of sins to other men, sinners as they are, these false teachers are committing a big sin against God. I was one of them. I stopped doing this, hearing confessions and confessing my own sins to other men. Free salvation. So many things, so many ceremonies, so many actions I had to do in order to get a good place in heaven. And I was never sure to even get there, in spite of a complete faithfulness in fulfilling my duties as a religious and as a priest. I knew the verse that speaks of free salvation, but never took advantage of it. Quote, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians chapter 2. When saved, I continued to perform my priestly actions, but there was something in me that said, Why are you reciting this rosary? Don't you know that salvation is a free gift, the gift of God? And as a result of this verse, I dropped the many actions that I used to do in order to earn a better place in heaven and my salvation. I felt as if I was despising the Lord Jesus Christ when I was doing these things, as if He had not done enough for me, or what He had done were not perfect. But I know that, quote, He is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by Him, from Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. I understood that He took all the punishment I was due to receive on account of my sins, he didn't uh, do it 50%. In Isaiah, it is written of him, quote, the chastisement of our peace was upon him. The complete chastisement, not 50% of it. So, as the Apostle Paul puts it, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I came to appreciate the Lord Jesus Christ more and more in the measure I was getting rid of those things of the past. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. One of the actions I used to do every day was the celebration of the Mass. I had been taught that the Mass was the renewal of the sacrifice of Calvary made on the altar without the shedding of blood and offered to God for the forgiveness of sins of the living and of the dead. I was a priest in the Roman Catholic Church in order to celebrate Mass and forgive the sins in the name of God. All this was contrary to the Word of God in all its parts. When looking into the book of Hebrews and meditating upon what the unchangeable priesthood of Christ is, I was struck by the insistence given to the Word once. In chapter 7, verse 27, I read, For this speaking of his sacrifice on Calvary, he did once when he offered up himself. The Lord Jesus presents a comparison between himself and the priests of the Old Testament, saying in chapter 9, verse 11, But Christ being come an high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. And a little further, in the same chapter, we read in verse 25, quote, Nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others, for then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time, without sin unto salvation. And in chapter 10, verse 10, we read, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. 
And every priest stands daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, forever sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Isn't it nice? All this means that the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ is not to be renewed because he has done it perfectly and our sins are put away completely. But man says we must renew it. Who is right? God indeed. Man sins against God trying to renew what has been done perfectly once and for all. One will argue, did not the Lord Jesus say, do this in memory of me? That is true. And this is what Christians of the early church have started to do as soon as they could meet together after Pentecost. We read in Acts chapter 20, and upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them. This was the Lord's Supper that the Christians were doing in order to remember their Lord. The Apostle Paul gives a summary of this teaching in his first Corinthian letter, chapter 11, verse 26, quote, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. And still today the Christians, those who are saved and have confessed their faith publicly by water baptism, meet together each first day of the week to remember their Lord in sharing the Lord's Supper. It is exactly during one of these Lord's Supper where I have been invited one day that I recognized those who were really saved. I saw how happy they were to meet together and show their gratitude to their Savior and Lord in worship and thanks. This Lord's Supper was celebrated by those whose sins had been previously forgiven and washed. They did not celebrate it in order to have their sins forgiven, since the question of their sins had been settled once and for all by the shedding of the blood of Christ once and for all. What a difference with the celebration of the Mass to which I was obliged by the human theology. It was celebrated each day, each week, and sometimes many times a day in order to have our sins forgiven. And when I came across this verse in Hebrews that says, Quote, without the shedding of blood is no remission, I understood that the Mass was in contradiction with the Word of God being a bloodless sacrifice. It was God's answer to the anxious question that was always broiling in my mind. How many Masses do I need to attend or celebrate in order to have my sins forgiven? Since there was no shedding of blood, there was no remission nor forgiveness of sin. And even if we had to celebrate Mass during the whole eternity, the sins would still not be forgiven during the whole eternity. And consequently, we would always be under the judgment of God. We read in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 17, And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. What a gratitude in my heart to the Lord Jesus for His complete saving work on Calvary so complete that it allowed his father to forget my sins forever on account of his perfect satisfactory work. But in spite of this great satisfaction I had in my heart and appreciation toward the Lord Jesus, nevertheless I felt as an intruder since I was still a priest at the eyes of man. And the Lord brought me to the conviction that my priestly position was not good that I had to put it away. And I read this verse in the scripture, Hebrews 7, verse 24. But this man, the Lord Jesus, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood, wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. God says, There is only one priest, and this is my son, and his priesthood is unchangeable, cannot be transferred from him to any other man. But man says, we need some priests down here, and we will ordain some. 
Who is right? God indeed. And when I left the human priesthood, I understood God's plan for all the believers to become one in Christ, even in his priestly position in heaven. In First Peter we read, Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Therefore, all the believers, men, women, children, are priests in Christ. They are members of the holy priestly family of the Lord Jesus. I was told that it is impossible that so many priests might have been mistaken, so many bishops and even the Pope, who was such a deep influence in the modern society, might all be mistaken. I didn't want to start judging people. I confess that all these men have done wonderful things for the welfare of the people in many countries of the world. As far as I am concerned, I was convinced that even as a priest, I was not even a child of God, that my position as a priest was obtained by a human ordination. It came to me from men and not from God. I was ordained a priest because I had been previously baptized. Otherwise, I would have never been ordained a priest. Baptism is the door, the entrance into Christianity. It is what has made me a child of God, according to what I had been taught. And I know that nobody becomes a child of God through a ceremony or money or any other good deed. I personally became a child of God when I submitted to God's word that says, we read that in John, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. This is God's way for man to become his child. I have submitted myself to God's ways. I am his child. It is a question of faith, not of works. By grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. It's after I had repented for my sins and trusted the Lord Jesus for my salvation that God gave me his new life, the eternal life, which made me his child. And he asked me to give testimony of this life publicly. And this testimony required from the believer is made by water baptism. The saved one is baptized in order to demonstrate publicly what occurred when God saved him identification to his Savior who died for him, was buried and rose again from the dead. This is shown illustratively by baptism. Baptism doesn't save. It illustrates what God has done when I had been saved. But man says, we must be baptized in order to receive the life of God. Who is right? God or man? God indeed. If we do anything, even a religious thing or action, like baptism is, we contradict God's plans of free salvation by grace and faith. Now, if the baptism I had received when a baby did not make me a child of God, what about the sacrament of confirmation I had received at the age of ten? Was it good? What about the sacrament of order or priesthood? Was it good? Both of them are supposed to be given to those who are children of God. Since I was not a child of God, the confirmation fell upon nothing. And so with the priesthood. What about the bishop? His consecration fell upon nothing. What about the pope? He is consecrated and crowned the pope on nothing. I had been taught that the pope was the visible head of the church, while the Lord Jesus is the invisible head of the church. Where did the pope got this title and responsibility? My theology had taught me that in Matthew 16, verse 18, Peter had received his consecration as the first pope with the words of the Lord Jesus saying, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Today I know that this rock on, of which the Lord Jesus speaks here is not Peter, but the Lord Jesus himself. He is called the rock, the chief cornerstone. 
who were read in First Corinthians chapter 10, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Is it clear enough? It was clear enough for me. When I was accused to have lost faith in the Pope, when I left the church, I told my accusers, you are right. The faith I had in him, the Pope, was transferred to the real head of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray for the man called the Pope, so that he might repent like I did, and trust the Lord Jesus Christ like Peter did, when he answered to the Lord Jesus, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. This was his confession of faith in Christ, the Savior, although at this time he did not understand what he was talking about. According to the words of the Lord, Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Anyone who faces the good news of salvation by faith in the Lord Jesus must confess the Lord Jesus the same way, recognizing that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Christ, the Son of the living God. This is the declaration that the Lord Jesus is expecting to hear from anyone who wants to acknowledge Him as Savior and Master. I have recognized, too, that He is the one who has come to make propitiation for my sins. I have repented and turned to Him who is the Son of the living God, the one who has come from heaven to earth to pay the ransom of my sins. There is no salvation without this recognition, even if there are people who call themselves Christians and are holding very high responsibilities in their churches, from the humblest layman up to the Pope. I was in between. I had to answer the same question. Whom do you think the Lord Jesus is? The answer to this question will decide your present and future state. If you answer like Peter did, you won't become a Pope, but a child of God. This is what Peter did. Years after he wrote some letters to the Christians, he had a good opportunity to impose himself as Pope, but he did not do so because he was not a Pope. He calls himself a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. And in his first epistle, he writes, The elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Peter did not ask anybody to call him His Holiness, nor Reverend, nor any other title that belonged to God or to the Lord Himself. And needless to say, I was called Reverend Father very often by members of my congregation, and I could never explain the words of the Lord found in Matthew 23 that says, And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. In spite of this divine prohibition, men have continued to call their priests reverend, most reverend, Monsignor, His Holiness, and so on. God says no. Man says yes. How many arrows against God? When I left the church, many saw in this move out a desire to get married, camouflage, as they said, behind this idea of the gospel of free salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Well, it was not so. But the position of the church in regard to the celibacy of priests is condemned in the word of God. And this is another portion of scripture I could hardly explain when I was still a priest. Quote, now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience sealed with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. God says, Marriage is good for all men. Man says, Marriage is not good for priests and nuns. Who is right? God, indeed. In submission to the Pope, I had to preach doctrines that were not in the Bible, namely doctrines concerning Mary, the mother of Jesus. She was called the mother of God, 
the Immaculate Conception, the Assumption, the Mediatrix of all Graces, the Queen of the World, and many other titles that are given by men to this humble woman. All these titles are intimately connected with one another in the Roman Catholic theology. The starting point is the Mother of God. She is not the Mother of God, but the Mother of Jesus, the Son of God. He became a man. And in order to be consequent to this title of Mother of God, since it was not convenient that the, quote, the Mother of God might have been born in sin, the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception was introduced, attributed in the Word of God to the Lord Jesus, and testified by the angel who said to Mary, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. The Lord Jesus was immaculate in his conception because God himself was his father when he became a man in his mother's womb. And Mary, like any other creature, was born in sin. She didn't confess explicitly that she was a sinner, but did confess her need of a savior. Remember this, in Luke chapter 1, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my savior. If Mary is not immaculate in her conception, all the other titles attributed to her fall to the ground. They are the result of philosophical cavillations, of which we have to be aware of, like says Paul in Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of man, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. And I know that all the dogmas concerning Mary are the product of the philosophy of man. Nothing of them in the Bible. These are things that men have added. One of the titles given to Mary is Mediatrix of all graces. But the Word of God teaches that there is only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. I love Mary very much. She was the mother of my Savior and she has given me the example to be followed in my relationships with the Savior, when she said, quote, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And this is precisely what I did, and as a result I was saved. Mary has called the Lord Jesus her Savior. I have called him my Savior too, because I have recognized in him the one who paid for my sins on the cross of Calvary. Would you be ready to recognize him too and be saved? The Roman Catholic teaching has changed a lot since the time I left the church and it will continue to change because it is a human affair. The Lord Jesus has said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Why is there such a great assurance in trusting the Word of God? Because the Word of God doesn't change. Why is there such a great confusion in human organizations? Because they are always changing. Many friends asked me, how is it that you accepted all these doctrines before and that now you don't believe in them? Well, my answer is that I was blinded before and now I see. And the one responsible for me to see is the Holy Spirit. We read this in the Word of God, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. As far as I am concerned, letting the word of God be introduced into my heart, I let God search my heart and reveal to me what was wrong with me. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. I had my heart broken down to pieces. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, we read in Psalm 34, and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. I saw that the Lord Jesus had died for my sins, like he read in Isaiah chapter 53, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. I understood how much he loved me. We read in John chapter 15, Greater love hath no man than this, 
that a man laid down his life for his friends. And in Romans we read, God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I didn't resist in front of such a loving Savior. I confessed my sins to him, and I let him in. I let him take over my life. And thus was realized in me God's plans in his Son. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Dear friend, if you are not saved, remember you are lost. But the Lord, through his word of life, is at the door of your heart, and is asking you to let him in. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. God bless you.